this angle, I cannot see Rudolph. Oh. Right? I Gotta mean, be one of them. Looking for him? There's reindeer. the red reindeer outside? Right. It looks like Blitzen. Uh, I see. I thought Dasher. Really? Okay. Uh, listen, uh, speaking of Christmas lights uh, outside our world headquarters here at 48th there and 6th Avenue, tonight at 930 here in Rockefeller Center, they're going to light the Christmas tree. So if you're a tourist, come on down. If you live here, get out of the way. Run for the hills. Yeah. There's going to be great Traffic lock. and lots of streets closed. Indeed. Take the subway today. Anyway, thank you very much for joining us on this very busy Wednesday. Ainsley, good to have you back. Thanks. Great to be back. And we start right now with the Fox News alert. And it was a big win for Republicans. That's right. That lady right there, the senator in Mississippi, Cindy Hyde-Smith, beating out the Democratic challenger, Mike Epsey, in Mississippi's runoff election. Yeah, Jonathan Terry is live in Jackson, Mississippi, to break it all down. Jonathan, this wasn't as close as many thought. Yeah, Brian, Steve, and Ainsley, it was a comfortable victory, although somewhat closer than you might expect in a deeply red state. Uh, Cindy Hyde-Smith wasting no time, saying she's going to go back to Washington this morning and get right back to work. Take a look at the race board. You can see the margin here. Hyde-Smith made some gaffes during the campaign that were deemed uh, by some as racially insensitive, but she credits President Trump's support for bringing her to victory. Take a listen. Boy, being on that MAGA wagon, as we called it, the Make America Great Again bus, we have bonded, we have persevered, we have gotten through things. We were successful today. President Trump tweeted his congratulations to the senator, saying, we are all very proud of you, and Hyde Smith's opponent added his congratulations as well. She has my prayers as she goes to Washington to to unite a very divided Mississippi. And she has my prayers and my willingness to help her to, to do that. And this runoff settles the final uh, Senate race of the midterm elections. And so once the new Congress is sworn in, the balance of power in the Senate will be 53 Republicans to 47 Democrats. Back to you guys. All right. Jonathan Sari, live in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, the Republicans, even though that is a reliable red state, the Republicans weren't taking any chances. They sent over 100 operatives into Mississippi to turn out the vote. Spent $3 million on television advertising to bash Mr. Espy. And, of course, the President of the United States showed up in the state for two rallies the day before people did the vote. Well, Mississippi in 2016 went for President Trump by nearly 20%. Yeah. So that state does love the president or did, you know, go out to the polls to vote for him. I was very impressed with Epsi's concession speech. That was very nice. And was, we're going to work together. It was great. And if Senator Smith, uh, who's got two more years left, and then uh, on Thad Cochran's uh, term, because uh, he said he's not uh, doing well physically, I would love to see her go right to the black community because it looks like the black and white issue was on display. If you were black, you voted for uh, Espy. If you didn't, you voted for Smith. I would love to see her go right into the black community and say, let's start healing this rift in Mississippi. All right. Meanwhile, let's talk about what's going on on our southern border with Mexico, just to the south of San Diego. Apparently, the mayor of Tijuana says they only have enough money to fund the migrant shelter for two more days. Uh, and in fact, on Monday, schools near the border were shut down over safety concerns uh, because of what happened over the weekend, where hundreds of people raced toward the American border. Well, Christian Nielsen saying there are about 10,000 they're expecting to be there when all the numbers are totaled. The two countries are going to work together to keep asylum seekers in Mexico as they're waiting for, for uh, asylum to come through or for their paperwork to come through. Mike Pompeo is going to sit down with the Mexico foreign minister on Sunday because the, the president-elect goes into office on Saturday. So they'll meet together on Sunday, and then that foreign minister is also going to talk with other people in the administration on Monday. Yeah, you forget, uh, like us, they have an election, but then you got to wait some time to stand up a government. So we've been dealing with Nieto and his outgoing government and the new one in, which on paper you would think uh, philosophically we'd have more trouble with, but it looks like the Trump administration getting along with the new administration a little bit better. Mm -hmm. I think it's just astounding, too, that the migrants have a list of demands that Grip Jenkins was able to acquire, one of which were an acceleration of a process applying for a asylum and an end to the arbitrary manipulative uh, uh, manipulative involuntary deport deportations. Wait a second. 
you have demands in order for you to come into the country? That seems to me a little bit uh, the world's spinning on its head. Well, remember, it was a couple of weeks ago the president of the United States said by executive order he was going to change the rules and say that uh, if you wanted to claim asylum, you had to go through a port of entry, mm -hmm. an official port like San Ysidro down in California. Uh, California. Well, now the Trump administration is going to appeal. Remember that Ninth Circuit judge, he said that that is unconstitutional. You don't have to go through a port. You can just touch the uh, land and you can make an asylum claim. Uh, apparently, the DOJ says the temporary restraining order, which uh, the judge issued last 30 days, says that that undermines the president's authority. And when it comes to asylum, keep in mind, if you simply want to come to the country to make money or to be reunited with your with your family, that is not an accurate and lawful asylum claim. Uh, Buck Sexton was on with Tucker last night and had a lot to say about this. It's a scam, and people know it's a scam based on the percentage of individuals in the past who have come and tried to claim asylum in this way, and the fact that they're being coached to lie. This is actually a form of fraud. When you say that I'm in imminent fear of my life because people along the way have said, this is what you have to say to get into the asylum process you can later be adjudicated, you're lying to people in a vast majority of these cases. And by the way, if just being from Honduras, for example, means you're in such threat of violence that you could get asylum, then the whole country would qualify for asylum. Uh, it's a great point, and uh, Kirsten Nielsen did a great job breaking it down with Sean Hannity last night as well. But I just would say this. Uh, if you want to come here and work, I would love to have to expedite a system to have work visas for people to get background checks because people in the rural communities, the farming communities, absolutely need the help. And it would be a great way to establish yourself here and begin the process of maybe becoming an American citizen. But there's got to be part of immigration reform is stuff that is really not going to be an ideological battle. That's one of them. That's one of the parts we can get on the same page. I was listening to some of the interviews that Griff did last night. And these people go, listen, I just want a job. Okay, I understand that's not good enough for asylum, but it might be something we need here. So put them in a different line. Just change well, the law. Right. The system's broken. We need immigration reform. And it makes common sense. The president doesn't want people just to be able to go through between ports. He wants to know who's coming in and because right. of cr criminal issues. I mean, that is a factor here. We want our kids, we want our families to be safe. And, yeah, it's... It's it's really heartbreaking when you see the families there at the border that are trying to have a better life for for their kids. But, right. and, but look and, at this. Dan Bongino says if you don't want tear gas in your face, then don't storm the border. And you could see in some of those images, you could see some of the migrants throwing uh, rocks and projectiles at the border patrol. After that, uh, they were they you know they use pepper spray and they use tear gas, and there has been uh, great uh, media outrage over it. But when you look at the numbers and the number of times that uh, the Customs and Border Patrol during the Obama administration used uh, similar things, similar tactics. Uh, it is astounding. 26 times in 2012, 27 times in 13, 15 in 14, 8 in 15, and th uh, 3 times in 2016. So more than 80 times. Yeah, 80 times. Uh, and then uh, over the weekend, they used it to push back what they referred to as assaultive migrants on Sunday. All right, so they've used this tactic for years, right? Uh, and yet, when you look at uh, the Media Research Center did uh, coverage of the caravan over the last couple of days, how many times did they mention the fact that they used them during the Obama administration? Mm, zero on the right. uh, nightly news. So Senator Lindsey Graham was on with uh, Sean last night and said, look, uh, I understand what's going on at the border. You really got to hate President Trump to not understand this is non-lethal reaction to control what's happening in and out of our country. Listen. How long does it take you to figure this out? When it comes to Obama, when he uses tear gas, he's protecting the country. Uh, the narrative is that Trump is a cruel, heartless only works if he uses tear gas on kids and it undercuts the argument if the Obama administration used tear gas to protect our our border from being overrun the question for the country is what do you say to the people who shot the canisters I stand behind the men and women on the border standing between us and people who want to cross illegally when you're slamming the tear gas you're slamming the people we put on the border to protect us and that's what disgusts me the most a criticism of tear gas is a criticism of our law enforcement and they're just doing their job this is a procedure and he said it's non-lethal 
this is just the way the system's set up. Right. Uh, I would like to also add to this uh, on the subplot of this whole border battle is the president saying, I want $5 billion to build the wall. This reaffirms it. Both sides tend to realize that that storming of the border on Sunday hurt uh, the migrants' cause big time. So it looks like Chuck Schumer says, I am looking to give $1.6 billion in addition for border security. The president wants $5 billion. I'm wondering if Democrats realize, okay, I'm two years away from another election or a year before we really have to dig in on this. Maybe they see it's not an advantage holding out doing nothing. Maybe they could sit and talk and maybe get three billion for the wall. Well, the House has already approved five billion. The Senate's already agreed to one point six billion. So essentially, Chuck Schumer is saying, you know what? Maybe that's all we're going to do. But the president uh, was talking to the Washington Post yesterday, and he said, you know what? Uh, maybe I've got a plan B. Maybe we'll just use troops. Maybe we'll just use razor wire down there because it seems to be effective in California. But I think that if you have the House at five and the Senate at 1.6, they know they're in a lame duck session so they could play ball. Maybe get together in a I, conference I wish real you were quick right. and so go ahead three? and do it. You're thinking three Let's, billion? Can we work something out? I can pretty much do the math in my head. We can start beginning to compromise on something instead of just getting in line and saying, oh, maybe this advantage can get me another vote on election day in two years. But the president was suggesting that he would go to the mat and uh, force a partial government shutdown by December 7th if he didn't get the wall money. But now he's talking about a plan B. So I think he sees the writing on the wall. And he's not going to get any. He's not going to right exactly. He's not going to see get any more money from the Democrats. So maybe he's going to have to go to. One point six can keep you busy for a year, can't you? One point six get, and then you go back next right. year and get another two. Oh, so oh, now yeah. you want one point six? No, I thought, you wanted, already I thought you wanted the three. I want. I would say <laughs> something in order to get something done, rather than sit there and shut down the government and hear all these speeches and get people enraged again. Yeah. A little bit is better I'm than I'm done that. with this. Okay. All right, let's hand it over to Jillian, who has some more headlines. Good morning. Good morning, morning. Whatever Brian wants, you know. Just Thank you, Jillian. Give you I want one. something. <laughs> All right, how about this? An investigation is underway after an active shooter alert turns out to be a false alarm. One hour of chaos unfolding at Walter Reed Medical Center in Maryland as patients, doctors, and visitors locked themselves in rooms fearing for their lives. The Navy now says someone was planning a future drill and accidentally activated the system. The words exercise or drill were not included, though, in text and email alerts. Today, lawmakers will be briefed on the murder of Saudi columnist Jamal Khashoggi. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and Defense Secretary James Mattis will talk to senators behind closed doors before they vote on U.S. support for Saudi Arabia's war in Yemen. Several Saudi agents face the death penalty after Khashoggi was murdered and dismembered at the kingdom's consulate in Istanbul last month. Also happening today, House Democrats will meet behind closed doors to elect new leadership. Minority leader Nancy Pelosi expected to win the nomination for House Speaker. She won't officially get the title until January 3rd when a public floor vote takes place. More than a dozen Democrats have vowed to vote against her. So look at your headlines. I will send it back to you. She wins. She'll win. Yeah, she's All right. got it. Definitely. All right. Uh, meanwhile, President Trump says he may cancel his meeting with Vladimir Putin at the G20 summit over the tensions in Ukraine. So how should the United States deal with the conflict between Ukraine and Russia? Dan Hoffman served as CIA station chief in Moscow. He's got a pretty good idea. That's a good up. picture of him. Plus, you know the scientist who says that he created the first gene-edited babies? He just made another big announcement overnight. Hmm. Please, get out from Ukraine, Mr. Putin. In this situation, I count on the United States. The Russian will pay a huge price if they attack us. The president of Ukraine talking to President uh, Trump, urging him to deliver its clear message to Vladimir Putin after Russia seized three Ukrainian ships and 24 sailors. The president is supposed to meet with Putin at the G20 this week, but is now reportedly thinking about canceling. Is that a good idea? Fox News contributor Daniel Hoffman is a former CIA station chief and served in Moscow. He joins us right now. Daniel, what the Russians did and what Putin did uh, with those Ukrainian ships, that was no mistake, was it? That wasn't an accident. No, he knows that the G20 summit is around the corner, and he's kind of looking for a fight, which I think he believes he can win. 
Okay, he thinks he can win. So the question is, what does the United States do? Uh, should the president of the United States talk to Putin? Should he cancel the trip? What should he do? Yeah, I, I would encourage the president to meet with Putin and hold him publicly accountable for Russia's nefarious, this latest instance of Russia's nefarious aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we know from the Obama administration's experience, when you talk to Russia and, and, and don't have any countermeasures, it only encourages Russia's further aggression. So I think we need to do some other things as well. But it starts with that public overt re rebuke of Putin. I think the president could deliver that strongly. Yeah, and you say nothing uh, threatens Putin's regime more than a Ukraine, a democratic neighbor with a bright economic future and sizable Russian-speaking population. He just doesn't like them right, right over there next to him. Yeah, I mean, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and nothing scares him more than a country like Ukraine right. uh, committed to democracy. That's an inspiration, a beacon of hope to Putin's own opponents who, who don't enjoy those same civil liberties. So, Daniel, you see this as a, a, a true test of the president's power uh, internationally. If he plays this right, it's a good thing, obviously, but there's peril in it, isn't there? Well, I, I think there's a lot the United States can do, but I think we need to bring along our NATO allies. Mm -hmm. We could consider a NATO deployment to, to the Black and, and Azov Seas to support Ukraine. We can deliver okay. lethal maritime uh, assistance and other weapons. We could even declare Russian officials persona non grata, but I think the United States needs to take the lead in, in collaboration with our allies. Okay, the key, though, is you say the president should go and talk to him. Let's see what he does. Daniel Hoffman, former CIA station chief in Russia. Daniel, thank you. Thank you. All right. What do you think about that? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Meanwhile, straight ahead on this Wednesday, one state thought legalizing marijuana was a good idea, but it's getting so bad, pot smokers are flooding the streets. We're going to tell you where that is. Plus, Bill and Hillary Clinton kicking off their new speaking tour, but there weren't a lot of people there to see them, reportedly. Tommy Lahren says it might as well just be a Trump campaign ad. She's going to join us next to explain. Some quick headlines for you. A town holds an emergency meeting after pot smokers flood the streets and clog traffic. Oh, it's been a nightmare. I mean, I'm talking hundreds of cars a day. The pot shop is one of only two dispensary dispensaries selling recreational marijuana in the state of Massachusetts. The state just started allowing pot sales this month and officials expect the crowd to die down once more store licenses are approved. And don't expect this bag to be claimed. U.S. Customs agents find a suitcase filled with $1.3 million worth of cocaine oh at New York's JFK Airport. The 38 bricks weighing more than 100 pounds arrived on a flight from Ecuador. Somebody put that on the plane? Holy yes. cow. <laughs> Meanwhile, are Bill and Hillary Clinton losing their touch? The Clintons kicked off a 13-city speaking tour, but the 19,000-seat arena they started in reportedly more than half empty as they took the stage to react to the midterms and, of course, attack the current president. I think it does lay the groundwork for the House of Representatives holding the Trump administration accountable, which is way overdue. And to require Republicans who are of goodwill and don't want to make Please get out from Ukraine, Mr. Putin. In this situation, I count on the United States. The Russian will pay a huge price if they attack us. The president of Ukraine talking to President uh, Trump, urging him to deliver its clear message to Vladimir Putin after Russia seized three Ukrainian ships and 24 sailors. The president is supposed to meet with Putin at the G20 this week, but is now reportedly thinking about canceling. Is that a good idea? Fox News contributor Daniel Hoffman is a former CIA station chief and served in Moscow. He joins us right now. Daniel, what the Russians did and what Putin did uh, with those Ukrainian ships, that was no mistake, was it? That wasn't an accident. No, he knows that the G20 summit is around the corner and he's kind of looking for a fight, which I think he believes he can win. 
Okay, he thinks he can win. So the question is, what does the United States do? Uh, should the president of the United States talk to Putin? Should he cancel the trip? What should he do? Yeah, I, I would encourage the president to meet with Putin and hold him publicly accountable for Russia's nefarious, this latest instance of Russia's nefarious aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we know from the Obama administration's experience, when you talk to Russia and, and, and don't have any countermeasures, it only encourages Russia's further aggression. So I think we need to do some other things as well. But it starts with that public overt re rebuke of Putin. I think the president could deliver that strongly. Yeah, and you say nothing uh, threatens Putin's regime more than Ukraine, a democratic neighbor with a bright economic future and sizable Russian-speaking population. He just doesn't like them right, right over there next to him. Yeah, I mean, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and nothing scares him more than a country like Ukraine right. uh, committed to democracy. That's an inspiration, a beacon of hope to Putin's own opponents who, who don't enjoy those same civil liberties. So, Daniel, you see this as a, a, a true test of the president's power uh, internationally. If he plays this right, it's a good thing, obviously, but there's peril in it, isn't there? Well, I, I think there's a lot the United States can do, but I think we need to bring along our NATO allies. Mm -hmm. We could consider a NATO deployment to, to the Black and, and Azov Seas to support Ukraine. We can deliver okay. lethal maritime uh, assistance and other weapons. We could even declare Russian officials persona non grata, but I think the United States needs to take the lead in, in collaboration with our allies. Okay, the key, though, is you say the president should go and talk to him. Let's see what he does. Daniel Hoffman, former CIA station chief in Russia. Daniel, thank you. Thank you. All right. What do you think about that? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Meanwhile, straight ahead on this Wednesday, one state thought legalizing marijuana was a good idea, but it's getting so bad, pot smokers are flooding the streets. We're going to tell you where that is. Plus, Bill and Hillary Clinton kicking off their new speaking tour, but there weren't a lot of people there to see them, reportedly. Tommy Lahren says it might as well just be a Trump campaign ad. She's going to join us next to explain. That's right. Mexico has offered temporary asylum and temporary jobs, in some cases up to two years, but they don't want that because they say the jobs are too low paying and they want to get to the United States. Many of them have uh, family there and they're not deterred by the fact that the administration, Secretary Nielsen says that over 90% of them won't even qualify for asylum. Steve? Wow, it's, it's all coming to a head because more are coming in their own caravans right behind this one. Right. Grift, are they offering, Mexico's offering asylum to everyone? I think not everyone, because, you know, we'll go a little bit more into that delegate Moreno, because he said, just like the Trump administration, he told me, we're worried about whether or not they were, in his words, delinquent into their criminal past. So he says if they want to come here without a record and they want to work, they will offer them uh, possible temporary arrangements. But if they have a problem with their uh, past history, the, the Mexican officials here in Tijuana want them gone as well. All we'll right. bring that to you in the next hour. Griff Jenkins live in Tijuana. Thank you very much. All right, nobody wants Jillian gone. <laughs> no, we right? don't. Yeah. <laughs> we Jillian, need you. We're glad Thank you're here. Thank you. Oh, I love you guys right back. All right, let's get you caught up on your headlines, starting with this. The Chinese scientist behind the first genetically edited babies claims another is on the way. The man says a second woman is pregnant with a child that will be resistant to HIV and AIDS. The first gene-edited babies, a pair of twin girls, were just born this month. Many scientists say his work is unethical and could harm other genes. Gene editing is banned in the U.S. Students as young as 10 years old protesting a visit by Ivanka Trump and Apple CEO Tim Cook. High school students also walked out of class complaining about the iPads Apple donated to the low-income Idaho school district because they reduced interactions with teachers. A group protested the Trump administration outside the school. Others showed support. How do you stop a bad guy with a gun? A college in Michigan says use a hockey puck hockey coach for my kids when they were growing up and I remember getting hit in the head with a hockey puck once and it hurt. The hockey puck fits really well into your briefcase or your backpack. It doesn't roll around when you're taking out your books. 
800 pucks have been sent to Oakland University, faculty members in case of a potential active shooter. Another 1,700 will go to students. And take a look at this, a life-size replica of Noah's Ark preparing to set sail from Holland to Israel. The builder says it only makes sense to take God's ship to God's land. The only problem, the 2,500-ton ship doesn't have a motor and needs to be pulled by tugboats. It'll cost the builder over a million dollars to make the trip. I mean, it's pretty cool to look at, but... This doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Well, the original yeah. didn't have a motor. <laughs> it's very true. Okay. There's, <laughs> one, there's one in the United States, right, that you can take your kids to and visit. Is it in your neck of the woods, like Pennsylvania or something? I'll have to find out. I don't know about it's that. In Kentucky, I'm being told. You can go and take your kids and have, like, the life experience. There was a movie out. They really yeah, found Noah's Ark. I mean, they found it, the real it was one. a documentary where they <laughs> right. presumed They found it in the mountain. Well, did you know the rainbow is God's promise? The ra Remember and God said, I'll never send a flood like that again? And so yep. every time we see the rainbow, I tell my daughter, that's God's promise. All right. Yeah. Speaking of rainbows, uh, Janice Dean's always looking for one. She's out on the streets of New York City where it's <laughs> downright cold today. I like that transition, though. It yes, brilliant. It is cold. We could actually could see a few snowflakes in the New York City area. Let's take a look at those chilly maps. It is cold as far south, by the way, as Florida. Freeze advisories for parts of northern Florida and the Gulf Coast. So there are your temperatures. That's the wind chill. So single digits, teens, feels like 29 here in New York. York and there's the snow. We're not talking about a big storm system, mainly lake effect snow, but we could actually see some of those snowflakes reach towards the New York City area in the next couple of hours. Past 24 hours for the West Coast, this is going to be a big story. It's going to provide a lot of much needed rain for parts of California, including Southern California, but a lot of rain could mean the potential for flooding and mudslides and debris flows. So this is a couple of systems that are going to move in. Also a big snowpack for parts of the Sierra, uh, so we'll watch for that. And and that's going to be the next system that actually moves across the central U.S., bringing the potential for another snowstorm and maybe some severe weather, which we'll be tracking on Thursday and Friday. All right, can I come back inside now? Please, no. no. Okay. <laughs> yes, indeed. Bright said no. She doesn't listen to me. That's uh, okay. Uh, she's inside now. All right, uh, meanwhile, President Trump threatening to cut the subsidies for General Motors and gearing up for new trade talks with China. What impact will all of this have on the economy? We're going to crunch some numbers coming up. Yep, we're talking trade. Plus, it's one of the biggest car events of the year and we're getting a sneak peek at cars that haven't been seen until now asterisk asterisk we're live at the los angeles auto show Good morning and welcome back. Some quick headlines now. And listen up if you want free coffee. Starbucks bringing back its Starbucks for Life contest, and it's worth a latte money. Get it? <laughs> Nearly. <laughs> I'm so cheesy. Nearly $57,000 to be exact to enter. Just buy something with your Starbucks loyalty account. The contest ends on December 31st. And why not grab a donut with that coffee? Krispy Kreme whipping up ugly sweater-inspired sweets just in time for Christmas. The chain also bringing back its Santa Belly Donut and adding a peppermint mocha to its menu. Brian. All right, President Trump taking on GM after the de their decision to cut thousands of American jobs. The president tweeting this, very disappointed with General Motors and their CEO, Mary Barra, for closing plants in Ohio, Michigan, and Maryland. Nothing being closed in Mexico and China. The U.S. saved GM, and this is the thanks we get. We are now looking at cutting all GM subsidies. So how will this impact the economy? Peter Marici is an economist and business professor at the University of Maryland and a national columnist joins us now. Is the president, I understand the president's sentiment, are you okay with him putting his hand in the free market? Oh, I'm okay with him criticizing General Motors. I think some criticism is due. They used the president's tariff as sort of a cover. When that tariff on steel $200 on a $35,000 car. What's more, General Motors gets a 25% tariff protection on trucks and SUVs, and Barra is moving all of her production under that umbrella. You didn't see her talking about that, did you? No, we didn't. And I want to bring something else up. They got a huge corporate tax cut, didn't they? And wasn't the thought was that the American industry would start bringing industry home because our corporate tax rate was now competitive? Absolutely. There's no reason why we shouldn't be selling cars in China that are made here. Now, the president has to open up the Chinese market, and, you know, I guess that's the next stage. But abandoning the American worker, she says that Americans aren't buying sedans. Do you see Toyota getting out of the sedan business? They make money on sedans. They know how to make sedans well. The problem with Ms. Barra 
is she heads a company that doesn't make competitive sedans. And to blame the president or to say that some far off notion like electric cars and electric vehicles is going to be where the future is, that's true. But, you know, we're not going to be switching out of the internal combustion engine or abandoning yeah. sedans anytime soon. Especially when the internal combustion engine pushes the trucks that America seems to love with gas prices so low. I want to move on, Peter. We could talk about that for a while and we will at other points. But the president's going to be sitting down with China and the world is uh, gyrating because these two behemoths, these two uh, monster economies economies are locking horns right now. The New York Times says today the president sees the rising interest rate and the gyrations in our market and may be looking to do a deal. Is China ready? Do you believe the U.S. is ready? Oh, I think the United States is always ready for a real deal. Uh, we're free traders at heart, and so is Mr. Trump. But China's not ready for a deal. President Xi thinks China is on a path to global dominance, that the Americans are just whiners, and if he bicycles Mr. Trump, then he'll get to the next president, and he'll be okay. The fact is, the Democrats, while they don't say much about this, are quite supportive of this policy. I mean, Hillary Clinton said the very same things during the campaign. I doubt that a Democratic president would treat them any better. But this said... Mr. Trump has to get a lot tougher on China. Most of his tariffs are 10%. They've depreciated the currency by more than 7 So despite what the Wall Street Journal says, despite what they say, it's had very little effect on General Motors or any other company in the United States. So we might up, after January 1st, we might up the, uh, the percentage of tariffs on China. China's like, hey, listen, I hope you back off that. This is going to be an interesting stare down or handshaking that's going to be taking place next week. But I think the global market would love for the U.S. and China to make some real progress. Is there a chance that China's slowing stock market and uh, the problems that they're having domestically might them to make them pliable now. I don't believe so. I don't think China is under enough stress. Now, we put on a 25% tariff and then do some of the things that Secretary Mnuchin has been nixing. You know, the president was quite correct to, to, to criticize him. He's been leaning against this all along. When he spoke to me, he expressed great skepticism that the trade deficit mattered at all, at all, at all. That was very disappointing, that conversation. So, My so, feeling... Yeah is that we need to not only put on the 25% tariff, but we need to do some of the other things. For example, ban Huawei and ZTE's exports for 5G into the United States. It's a national security threat. And start to put on much tougher sanctions on Chinese investment here. You know, they can buy just about whatever they want in this country, but we can only invest in what they permit us right. to invest, and only if Chinese actors have control. So you want more of the Robert Lighthizer taking the lead. He's tougher on trade than Steve Mnuchin, who never wanted to do this fight to begin with. So we'll see who the president's listening to in this battle. Uh, Peter, thanks so much. Lighthizer's the man. Okay. All right. Nice way to end. All right. 11 minutes before the top of the hour. Republican leaders sitting down with the president to work out a deal to get the border wall built. How'd it go? Congresswoman Liz Cheney, the highest ranking woman in uh, the House, uh, on the Republican side, will be joining us live next hour. And we're getting a sneak peek at brand new cars that haven't been seen until now. Live at Los Angeles Auto Show. We got the keys. They're not even up yet in Los Angeles. This program is brought. Please get out from Ukraine, Mr. Putin. In this situation, I count on the United States. The Russian will pay a huge price if they attack us. The president of Ukraine talking to President uh, Trump, urging him to deliver its clear message to Vladimir Putin after Russia seized three Ukrainian ships and 24 sailors. The president is supposed to meet with Putin at the G20 this week, but is now reportedly thinking about canceling. Is that a good idea? Fox News contributor Daniel Hoffman is a former CIA station chief and served in Moscow. He joins us right now. Daniel, what the Russians did and what Putin did uh, with those Ukrainian ships, that was no mistake, was it? That wasn't an accident. No, he knows that the G20 summit is around the corner and he's kind of looking for a fight, which I think he believes he can win. OK, he thinks he can win. So the question is, what does the United States do? Uh, should the president of the United States talk to Putin? Should he cancel the trip? What should he do? Yeah, I, I would encourage the president to meet with Putin and hold him publicly accountable for Russia's nefarious 
this latest instance of Russia's nefarious aggression against Ukraine. Uh, we know from the Obama administration's experience when you talk to Russia and, and, and don't have any countermeasures, it only encourages Russia's further aggression. So I think we need to do some other things as well. But it starts with that public overt re rebuke of Putin. I think the president could deliver that strongly. Yeah, and you say nothing uh, threatens Putin's regime more than a Ukraine, a democratic neighbor with a bright economic future and sizable Russian-speaking population. He just doesn't like them right, right over there next to him. Yeah, I mean, Putin called the collapse of the Soviet Union the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century, and nothing scares him more than a country like Ukraine right. uh, committed to democracy. That's an inspiration, a beacon of hope to Putin's own opponents who, who don't enjoy those same civil liberties. So, Daniel, you see this as a, a, a true test of the president's power uh, internationally. If he plays this right, it's a good thing, obviously, but there's peril in it, isn't there? Well, I, I think there's a lot the United States can do, but I think we need to bring along our NATO allies. Mm -hmm. We could consider a NATO deployment to, to the Black and, and Azov Seas to support Ukraine. We can deliver okay. lethal maritime uh, assistance and other weapons. We could even declare Russian officials persona non grata, but I think the United States needs to take the lead in, in collaboration with our allies. Okay, the key, though, is you say the president should go and talk to him. Let's see what he does. Daniel Hoffman, former CIA station chief in Russia. Daniel, thank you. Thank you. All right. What do you think about that? Email us, friends at foxnews.com. Meanwhile, straight ahead on this Wednesday, one state thought legalizing marijuana was a good idea, but it's getting so bad, pot smokers are flooding the streets. We're going to tell you where that is. Plus, Bill and Hillary Clinton kicking off their new speaking tour, but there weren't a lot of people there to see them, reportedly. Tommy Lahren says it might as well just be a Trump campaign ad. She's going to join us next to explain. That's right. Mexico has offered temporary asylum and temporary jobs, in some cases up to two years, but they don't want that because they say the jobs are too low paying and they want to get to the United States. Many of them have uh, family there and they're not deterred by the fact that the administration, Secretary Nielsen says that over 90% of them won't even qualify for asylum. Steve? Wow, it's, it's all coming to a head because more are coming in their own caravans right behind this one. Right. Grift, are they offering, Mexico's offering asylum to everyone? I think not everyone, because, you know, we'll go a little bit more into that delegate Moreno, because he said, just like the Trump administration, he told me, we're worried about whether or not they were, in his words, delinquent into their criminal past. So he says if they want to come here without a record and they want to work, they will offer them uh, possible temporary arrangements. But if they have a problem with their uh, past history, the, the Mexican officials here in Tijuana want them gone as well. All we'll right. bring that to you in the next hour. Griff Jenkins live in Tijuana. Thank you very much. All right, nobody wants Jillian gone. No, we right? don't. Yeah. <laughs> we Jillian, need you. We're glad Thank you're here. you. Oh, I love you guys right back. All right, let's get you caught up on your headlines, starting with this. The Chinese scientist behind the first genetically edited babies claims another is on the way. The man says a second woman is pregnant with a child that will be resistant to HIV and AIDS. The first gene edited babies, a pair of twin girls, were just born this month. Many scientists say his work is unethical and could harm other genes. Gene editing is banned in the U.S. Students as young as 10 years old protesting a visit by Ivanka Trump and Apple CEO Tim Cook. High school students also walked out of class complaining about the iPads Apple donated to the low-income Idaho school district because they reduced interactions with teachers. A group protested the Trump administration outside the school. Others showed support. How do you stop a bad guy with a gun? A college in Michigan says use a hockey puck hockey coach for my kids when they were growing up and I remember getting hit in the head with a hockey puck once and it hurt. The hockey puck fits really well into your briefcase or your backpack. It doesn't roll around when you're taking out your books. 800 pucks have been sent to Oakland University, faculty members in case of a potential active shooter. Another 1,700 will go to students. And take a look at this, a life-size replica of Noah's Ark preparing to set sail from Holland to Israel. The builder says it only makes sense to take God's ship to God's land. The only problem, the 2,500-ton ship doesn't have a motor and needs to be pulled by tugboats. It'll cost the builder over a million dollars to make the trip. I mean, it's pretty cool to look at, but...
This doesn't seem like it makes a lot of sense. Well, the original yeah. didn't have a motor. <laughs> it's very true. Our there's point. one There's one in the United States, right, that you can take your kids to and visit. Is it in your neck of the woods, like Pennsylvania or something? I'll have to find out. I don't know about it's that. In Kentucky, I'm being told. You can go and take your kids and have, like, the life experience. There was a movie out. They really yeah, found Noah's Ark. I mean, they found it, the real it was a one. documentary where they <laughs> right. presumed They found it in the mountain. Well, did you know the rainbow is God's promise? The ra Remember, and God said, I'll never send a flood like that again? And so yep. every time we see the rainbow, I tell my daughter, that's God's promise. All right. Yeah. Speaking of rainbows, uh, Janice Dean's always looking for one. She's out on the streets of New York City where it's <laughs> downright cold today. I like that transition, though. It yes, brilliant. It is cold. We could actually could see a few snowflakes in the New York City area. Let's take a look at those chilly maps. It is cold as far south, by the way, as Florida. Freeze advisories for parts of northern Florida and the Gulf Coast. So there are your temperatures. That's the wind chill. So single digits, teens, feels like 29 here in New York. York and there's the snow. We're not talking about a big storm system, mainly lake effect snow, but we could actually see some of those snowflakes reach towards the New York City area in the next couple of hours. Past 24 hours for the West Coast, this is going to be a big story. It's going to provide a lot of much needed rain for parts of California, including Southern California, but a lot of rain could mean the potential for flooding and mudslides and debris flows. So this is a couple of systems that are going to move in. Also a big snowpack for parts of the Sierra, uh, so we'll watch for that. And and that's going to be the next system that actually moves across the central U.S., bringing the potential for another snowstorm and maybe some severe weather, which we'll be tracking on Thursday and Friday. All right, can I come back inside now? Please, no. no. Okay. <laughs> yes, indeed. Bright said no. She doesn't listen to me. That's uh, okay. Uh, she's inside now. All right, uh, meanwhile, President Trump threatening to cut the subsidies for General Motors and gearing up for new trade talks with China. What impact will all of this have on the economy? We're going to crunch some numbers coming up. Yep, we're talking trade. Plus, it's one of the biggest car events of the year and we're getting a sneak peek at cars that haven't been seen until now asterisk asterisk we're live at the los angeles auto show